just a moment, we'll be looking at God's Word together. If you'd like to turn to Acts chapter 2, that's where we'll be in just a moment. But uh, I've just felt led of the Lord this morning to, to, to spend a, a little extra time in, in prayer, just in light of all that's going on in the world and in our, our community and in our church. Um, these are trying times. As, you, as we've watched on the news what's been going on in Afghanistan, for instance, it's just been heart-wrenching. Um, and we just really need to be in prayer for um, our fellow U.S. citizens and allies who are effectively now trapped behind enemy lines. Um, we need to be praying for um, minorities in that country, especially women and Christians for whom life is now going to be exponentially more dangerous and difficult. Um, we need to be praying for our government, the decisions that are being made. Uh, we, there's so many things we need to be praying about. We need to be praying for this, this pandemic, which is still wreaking havoc and causing chaos in our world. Um, pray that God would bring it to an end and, and that God would keep us faithful during this time. Um, this is a season when our world is desperately in need of hope. And, and so we need to really pray that we as God's people would, would step up and rise to the occasion and be the hands and feet of Jesus to provide the hope that only Jesus can provide, that, that this would be a season, even though it's a difficult and, 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 and hard season in so many ways, that, that we would really see some revival in our hearts and in the heart of our community and really around the world. Um, we need to be praying for all of these things, and we need to be praying for our church. We need to be praying for especially many individual families in our church for whom this has been a very difficult season, an extraordinarily difficult season. And, and I would just speak personally as the Burkhardt household, this has been a pretty rough season for us. And uh, if I were just to give you a little snapshot of what our life has looked like, let me give you a, a, an insight into one 24-hour window um, from earlier this week. Um, my daughter Krissa is, is back on break from grad school. It's been great having her back. And during her break, she decided to fly out and spend a week with her brother Bryce, who's working out in Virginia. And uh, they, there's a lot of beautiful trails in the mountains in Virginia. And so she and Bryce and a friend decided to go hiking up in the mountains on Monday. And I uh, had a great time, got to the top, took some great pictures. But on that hike, my son Bryce, in just sort of a freak accident, lost his footing slid 50 feet down a slick rock face wall, went over a waterfall, hit a boulder at the bottom, uh, fractured his kneecap, messed up his other ankle, bruised his ribs. Um, we're grateful he's alive. <laughs> um, and then he had to make the 1.7 mile hike back down the mountain on, on one fractured knee, on one messed up ankle. It took them three hours to get down that trail, much of it in the dark to the dim light of cell phones. Um, in, without cell service, on the way down they encountered two coiled rattlesnakes in striking position. Uh, I mean, it's just crazy. They got to the ER late at night. Uh, I'm texting and calling them at 2 and 3 in the morning. Uh, the ER managed to, to sort of fix Bryce up temporarily, encouraged him to go see a doctor the next day. On the way to the doctor, they were involved in an automobile accident. I mean, and the list just goes on, right? That's just one 24-hour slice of our week this past week, and that's just the frosting on the cake. There's so much more that I could tell you, not only about this week, but this month, and, and really the last year. And, and I share this with you, A, to express just gratitude to God for His protection, right? We're so grateful for His answered prayer. I don't share this with you to, you know, evoke any special sympathy, because I know we're not the only ones. We're not, right? I, I know that there are families and individuals in this church that have experienced that and far worse than what we've experienced. And, and, and this is a season when it, it just feels in many respects like we're kind of under attack. I think many of us are. You know, I'm not, I'm not one of these spooky guys that's all superstitious, but I do believe in spiritual warfare. I do believe that 1 Peter 5 is true when it says that our adversary, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And uh, it's, 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 it's difficult not to believe that some of us are under some attack, and maybe our church itself is under attack right now, you know? Um, and Elvie and I have had a lot of conversations about this, this this past week. It's a little scary to think about some of this, but at the same time, we've, we've, we've lived enough life and we've experienced enough ministry together that we've begun to see some recurring patterns, right? Um, things tend to go in cycles. And what we've noticed is that many times when Satan is applying his hardest pressure and, and when there's immense difficulty and trial and pressure in our lives, oftentimes what we've noticed is that season of pressure and hardship is almost immediately preceded by a season of tremendous blessing and growth, right? And it's almost as though Satan is trying to discourage and derail and, and distract us from what God's called us to do and be. And I think what that calls for is for us just to really be faithful in some of these tough seasons, to press through in the power of the Holy Spirit, and to really double down and devote ourselves to prayer, right? And so that's why I want to spend some time this morning doing that. Um, I've invited a couple men in our church just to lead us out in prayer in a couple of areas, and I'd like to invite you just in your heart to pray along with us as we pray this morning. So Lefty, please come and lead us, and then Joe Painter will pray as well. I'm 
There we go. Great to be in uh, with my Cornerstone family this morning. So glad to have all of you here, and it's uh, just a joy to be able to pray together and and uh, know that our God, the one true living God, hears all prayers and answers all prayers. So if you will, bow your heads. Let's spend a moment in prayer together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pause as we come into your presence and bow in awe before your majesty. Father, your holy word in Psalms 103 reminds us, Bless the Lord, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits, who pardons all your guilt, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with favor and compassion. Father, we come before you grateful that you call us to receive the free gift of salvation by placing our faith in your son, Jesus. His atoning sacrifice on the cross washes us clean, and his resurrection gives us everlasting life with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Lord, we come to you asking for your tender mercy on families mourning the loss of loved ones to COVID. We cry out to you for your healing touch for broken hearts and countless tears. We ask for your gentle hand to bring comfort for children wives, husbands, friends, and parents as they grieve. May the light of Jesus bring hope in the difficulty of suffering. Father, rid us of this disease, and in the days that we wait, give us strength to endure. Bring restoration to those afflicted. Bring wisdom to care providers. Bring peace to families. And bring a miracle by your hand for those who are sick, that you may be glorified. And Father, as we see the turmoil in Afghanistan unfolding before us, we pray for families in need of refuge, for those trapped and trying to flee the threat of the Taliban, for those who have risked everything to support our troops over the last 20 years. Please bring a path to safety. For the church in Afghanistan, we pray for your hedge of protection around your children and mighty servants attending to countless needs. May your glory shine like the sun before believers declaring you as the sovereign, one true living God. And may you equip our leaders with the wisdom and fortitude to act according to your will that lives will be saved and peace restored. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and long-suffering. We wait with reverence for your answer according to your perfect timing. You are mighty to save. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the great and glorious God. It's you who reign in sovereignty over all. It's you who determine the bounds and habitations of every nation and their times and seasons, as well as the leaders of those nations, their lawmakers and judges. It's you who exalt and it's you who dethrone. We praise you and bless you that you rule over all mankind and all, over all the kingdoms of this world. They are indeed your kingdoms. We praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, that by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, whether there are thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Father, we're facing 
troubling times in the world, in this nation. So we come before you, humbly bowing before you, confessing our sins and the sins of our nation, crying out with Daniel, O Lord, heal, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, restore. And it begins with us, Lord, the people of God. We ask that you would rescind revival in our midst, the fresh pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon each of us, and that we'd be submitted and humbly obedient in following you. And we pray that you would cause the people of our nation who are lost and are groping around for anything and everything to lay their hope in. Father, you have died for them and you have shed your blood, not only for us, but also for them. So, Lord, we pray that you would cause them to seek you with all of our heart, and we would see a mighty spiritual awakening in this country. We're reminded in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that we have this treasure, that is the life of Christ, in an earth and clay common pot that is so easily broken and so fragile. But within that, in that earthen vessel lies the resurrection power of Jesus. It's he who upholds us when we're afflicted, when we are perplexed and confused, when we're persecuted, and we, when we have been struck down by the incredible events that happened in a sinful world. Thank you, Lord, that we always carry in a, about in those circumstances, the dying of Jesus, but the end result is glorious, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in us. So we praise you for the hope of, re of the resurrection, and we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's at work in us. We ask that you would fill us, renew us, and strengthen us as your people, that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in prayer. Father, I want to lift up our church family. Um, I, uh, I'm just so grateful that uh, we know that you're sovereign and you're good and that uh, uh, Satan can do nothing in our lives apart from your permission. And so we would just humbly ask in this season that you would keep him on a very short leash. And, and to the extent that you allow him to afflict us or to try us, Lord, we pray that every effort that he makes to um, turn us away from you, would instead turn back on him and that you would be glorified and magnified and that you would accomplish good and godly purposes in our lives through it. Um, Lord, I pray for individual families in our church right now that are really going through a tough season. Lord, our hearts grieve with the Deweys. We just lift up uh, Liz and Alex as they grieve the passing of Kevin. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just um, wrap his arms around them and, 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 and lift them and carry them through this time. Help us to, to be the body of Christ for them in this season. Um, we lift up Brian Pilgreen, and uh, this was a tough week for him. He's sedated on a ventilator, and uh, there, there were some tenuous moments at the end of this week. We're so grateful for the report we got from Maggie yesterday that he's stable, and we pray, Lord, that that, that stable condition would move to an improving condition, and that you would just apply your healing touch to Brian's body, and that you would uh, heal him. Uh, give peace to Maggie and the kids during this difficult season. Um, Lord, there are so many others in our church that are going through difficult seasons and hardships, many of which we know about, many of which I'm sure uh, have not been shared with us, but Lord, we pray that for each person that you would, you would be their strength and their refuge. Um, Lord, we're grateful for the reminder in the book of Proverbs that, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, accomplish your good purposes in and through us, regardless of what you take us through, and uh, just be faithful as you have always been to us in this church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're in Acts chapter 2. Uh, next week, we will resume our study of the book of 1 Thessalonians, but if you want to turn to Acts chapter 2, and also, if you didn't happen to pick up one of these ministry menus on the way in, um, please feel free to grab one right now, and ushers are making them available. We'll be using this as we reference it throughout the course of the sermon this morning. But uh, as we think about um, a, a healthy, balanced diet, right, as we think about the things we put into our body, what constitutes a healthy, balanced diet? Well, that may not look identical for everyone, right? Uh, 
what, what, what might be a healthy diet for me may not look exactly like it does for you. It depends on your height, your weight, your metabolism, you know, your unique medical background, and all those different things, right? And, and, and no nutritionist would say that there's a one-size-fits-all diet where everybody needs to eat the exact same things at every single meal. Um, no. But what any good nutritionist will say is that if we want to have a healthy, balanced diet, then we're going to be intentional about selecting something to eat each day from a handful of basic food groups. If we go to that next slide, please. And sometimes these food groups are portrayed in a food pyramid, as here on the left. Uh, sometimes they're just a simple plate, and they actually make kitty plates that show you these are the basic food groups, and this is the proportions. That's more my speed. I kind of think in simple terms, right? That, that's helpful to me. But if you want to have a healthy diet, there's a variety of foods you can eat, of course, but you're going to want to select something from some fruits, some grains, some vegetables, some proteins, right? And, and, and if you do this in moderation, you'll, you'll be a generally healthy person, right? And, and by the way, if you sort of stray from this, if you just eat junk food that's not even on this list, or if you, if you eat too much of one thing to the neglect of other things, like for instance, if all you do is eat meat, right, <laughs> uh, that might taste good, but that's going to have a detrimental effect on your health long term, not to be rather unpleasant, right? And, and so these are things that are important, right? All of these things are important in balance. And I'm going to suggest to you that what's true in terms of our physical diet is equally true of our spiritual diet. Involvement in a local church family like this is vital to our spiritual health. But what should that involvement look like, right? What does healthy involvement in a local church look like? Well, if you grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist church like I did, the answer is every time the doors are open, you need to be there, right? You need to be involved in everything that the church is doing, which meant you were pretty much there all the time. You had no social life outside of church, which basically meant you never got to know your friends and neighbors, which had a very detrimental effect on evangelism, for instance, right? Uh, now, that's not our approach here at Cornerstone. Um, we want you to have a life outside of church. We want you to get to know your friends and neighbors and coworkers, and, and we realize that you're busy and that you have to make choices with your time, and, and we want to help you make healthy choices, and so what we're going to say to you this morning is that as you look at the lengthy menu of choices that our church has to offer, and we've literally put a menu in your hands, right? Um, as you look at these things, you don't need to do all of these things, but you do need to select something from a handful of some basic spiritual food groups, if you will. And here they are. We gather, we grow, we give, and we go. We gather for worship and fellowship, we grow through Bible study, we give of our time and treasure, we go and share the gospel with others. In that, in that one little phrase there, you've got a nice little snapshot, don't you, of, of a healthy Christian life, a well-balanced spiritual diet, especially as it relates to life in the local church. And I would say, by the way, each of these things are important, right? It, you take any one of these things out, it's going to have a detrimental effect on your spiritual life. Let me read to you a portion of a, a book that I ran across recently that I think is fascinating and illustrates this point very nicely. In 1989, when pediatric neurologist Dr. G. Robert DeLong of Duke University Medical School first visited the rural Chinese province Xinjiang, mental retardation in that village, that province, was severe. Other disabilities also prevailed. Miscarriages, high infant mortality, stunted growth, deafness, and stillbirths affected much of the population. Some of the fully developed adults appeared as small as children. Some of the five-year-olds looked like toddlers. According to DeLong, the children were truly in sad shape. He said, some showed extreme mental retardation and could not walk, stand, or even sit. Even the ones without severe signs of physical debilitation were slack and dull-eyed. Their livestock were similarly feeble and produced stillborn offspring, leaving the province desperately poor. Since this area of China had been regarded as inhabited by, quote, village idiots since Marco Polo's time in the 1200s, these people had largely been written off. The, the, these researchers began thinking that perhaps what the problem was is that they lacked iodine in their diet, uh, but iodized salt was not an option because of many cultural and political factors, including the fear of salt. Dr. DeLong and his colleagues in China explored and rejected many solutions for getting iodine into the people. Finally, DeLong looked at the irrigation ditches and wondered if iodine could be dripped into the water. That way, the plants would absorb the iodine, the animals would eat the plants, and the people on top of the food chain would get enough iodine. How did they do this? They had to be practical. Think low-tech. DeLong and his Chinese colleagues rigged a common 55-gallon oil drum on top of a rickety bridge that crossed the irrigation canal. They attached some intravenous tubing and clamps to provide a steady drip into the water. 
Next, they filled the drum with potassium iodate and measured how much iodine turned up in the downstream villages. When they were ready, they hired a local villager to guard the barrel from theft. At night, he slept on the bridge, rolled up in a blanket. As the iodine ran out, the villagers continued to refill the barrels. Listen to this. A year later, infant mortality dropped by half. Sheep production increased 40%. Later measurements showed the average five-year-old's height increased by four inches. The average intelligence of children born after the irrigation project increased 16 IQ points. Stillborn animals and miscarriage were reduced by 50%. 13 and one half tons of iodine have been dripped into the village's water. Iodine and dripping is now implemented for 2.6 million Chinese. The cost for such a life-saving, life-altering project less than six cents a person. That's all it cost to, relight the, to rewrite the lives of people who had been written off for five centuries. Isn't that amazing, right? Isn't it amazing to, to think how just one dietary nutrient lacking that can have such detrimental effects on, on an entire province? But you know, the same thing again is true spiritually. There are certain basic activities, certain functions of the Christian life that are vital to our spiritual health and growth. And if we neglect any of them, they will have a detrimental effect on our walk with the Lord, on our effectiveness of serving others. So, in the interest of designing a balanced diet for ourselves this morning, let's take a look at this menu together so that we can understand these basic four spiritual food groups and hopefully make some healthy selections for our lives. And to provide the biblical basis for our discussion this morning, I'd like to just take a very simple look, nothing terribly profound, but a very simple look together at Acts chapter 2. And here we see the founding of the very first church in human history. It was the Jerusalem church. And in verses 14 through 40 of this chapter, we see the Apostle Paul preaching a very powerful sermon, really basically declaring the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the beautiful reality that God took on human flesh, came to planet earth in the person of Jesus, and he died for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be spared the judgment we deserved. And he rose from the dead so that by his spirit, he could come into our lives and empower us and change us and make us the people he's called us to be. And one day he's coming back to make all things right and to establish his kingdom on earth. And Peter highlighted the fact that Jesus came to save us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. And one day the very presence of sin and the salvation that Jesus offers, it's not, a, it's not a reward that we can earn by doing good deeds, it's a, it's a free gift that we can only receive by faith. And he challenged the people that day to repent and to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And how did they respond? Verse 41 says this, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Now before we jump into the meat of this sermon, I just want to pause and ask some questions and highlight some things from this verse right here because there's some important steps that we see here and, and the steps not only are important, but so too is the order of these steps. First of all, they accepted Peter's message. In other words, they, they received and believed the gospel and they gave their lives to Jesus Christ. They received his free gift of salvation. And my simple question for you this morning is this, have you ever done that, right? Have you ever received God's free gift of salvation? Have you ever entrusted yourself to him as your Savior and Lord? I'm not asking if you believe in God. I'm not asking if you're a good moral or religious person. I'm asking, has there ever been a point in your life when you realize that you're a sinner who cannot save yourself, a, a sinner who is in desperate need of God's mercy, and you cried out to God and said, God, will you save me? Will you forgive me? Will you come into my life and change me? I want you to be my Savior and Lord. If you've never done that, let me invite you to, to express your faith in Jesus in that way this morning and experience His forgiveness, experience the hope of His resurrected Spirit living within you and empowering you for everyday life, the hope of eternal life one day. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, what's the next step? Well, notice after receiving the gospel and, and, and the good news of Jesus, they were baptized, right? And that's the logical step that follows. You may recall that in Matthew 28, Jesus told us we're to make disciples and then baptize them, right? Right? And the first step of public obedience once you've given your life to Jesus is to be baptized. In baptism, you're publicly proclaiming your faith in Jesus Christ. You're going public for Him in the presence of a community of believers like this who are there to, to celebrate that milestone with you and hold you accountable uh, on your newfound journey of faith. And that's such a vital, important uh, step to take. And I would simply say this, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, but maybe you've never followed that up by going public in baptism, we'd love the opportunity to talk to you about that and celebrate that important milestone with you. After they were baptized, about 3,000 were added to their number that day, right? 
And, and so they were saved, they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. This is church membership. This is incorporating officially with a, a local church family who can help you grow and, and, and encourage you on your spiritual journey. And again, I would simply ask this question. Maybe you've uh, given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've been baptized. But he, have, have you ever formally affiliated with a local church and, and connected and committed with a church family like this who can encourage you and, and strengthen you on your spiritual journey? If not, um, if you're interested in maybe considering membership here at Cornerstone, again, we'd like to invite you on September 12th to our Newcomers Lunch, um, where you can explore membership and learn about our church and understand what that commitment looks like. We'd love to have you join us on these things. Uh, but this is sort of a simple pattern that we saw in the early church, and it plays out even in our day today. And, and what we see here is that Peter preaches this very powerful sermon, people respond, and almost overnight, this massive church springs up overnight, right? What was once a handful of believers suddenly is a church numbering in the thousands, right? And as we see how this church functioned in the early days, I think we see here these four elements of a healthy spiritual diet. First of all, we see the importance of gathering for worship and fellowship. Notice verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The early church recognized the importance of gathering physically together as God's people, and they did it in two different forums. Number one, in the temple courts, and also in one another's homes. In other words, they gathered in large groups as one large group for a corporate worship experience, but then they also gathered in smaller groups for a more intimate relational experience where they could enjoy fellowship and encouraging one another. When they would gather in the temple, that was a massive space, and they could gather there in the thousands to worship God and to hear from His teaching, much like we're doing here this morning, right? And that corporate worship gathering of the church, what we're doing right now, don't ever underestimate the importance of, of what we're doing right now to, to our spiritual health and vitality. It is so important. And yet, I got to say, the corporate gathering of the church has sort of fallen on hard times in recent decades in the church in America. Think about it. There was a time that many of us can remember, it doesn't seem all that long ago, when uh, Sundays were regarded as sacred, even in our secular culture, right? Businesses were closed on Sundays. Uh, employers and schools would not have thought about scheduling a meeting on Sundays. That was the Lord's Day. That's the day when you worship with your church family and you rest, right? Uh, not so today. How far things have come, right? Nowadays, every business is open on Sundays, Except for one, the one we really want to be open on Sundays, Chick-fil-A, right? But that's another discussion right there. But, but businesses are, are open on Sundays. You can shop on Sundays. Um, employers, schools, uh, leagues think nothing of scheduling business meetings and games and tournaments on Sundays, right? Um, we're more affluent than we ever were. We have more options than we ever had. We're busier than we ever are. And now we suddenly find ourselves with all kinds of cultural pressure where there's all kinds of things competing for our, our time on Sunday morning, right? And sadly, many Christians have been in, uh, impacted by that such that, that the corporate worship gathering of the church has gotten bumped way down to the bottom of the list, right? And they'll still come now and then when it's convenient, when they're not tired, when they're not fishing, when they don't have something better to do. But, but many times today, sadly, many Christians don't really value the corporate worship gathering of the church like they used to. Then along comes a pandemic, right? And, and we experienced this, this lockdown where we were not able to physically gather, right? And we all had to do this kind of virtual thing for a season. And, and, and by the way, thank God for technology. Thank you for the opportunity to watch online and, and, and be here when you can't really be here, right? We're grateful for that. That's been a valuable tool in this season and continues to be for many people, right? We're grateful for that. Um, but, but my fear is that some people, many Christians, may well think, you know what? This this online experience is kind of nice. I don't have to get dressed and showered and brush my teeth and get in the car and drive somewhere. I can just sort of roll out of bed in my PJs and, and listen to the sermon while I'm sipping coffee and doing my crossword puzzles, right? And, 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 and sadly, all of these pressures coming to bear have, have I think, perhaps sadly minimized the, the importance of this physical gathering of the church for worship. And again, I want to say, there are some people who are still worshiping at home online, and, and we respect that. This is a difficult season, and every family needs to make those choices. We understand that. But I also want to reiterate the value of, of the physical gathering of the church, because frankly, simply just watching a screen cannot replace what we do here every Sunday morning. It can't, right? Just watching on a screen, you don't, you don't get to see people's faces, at least the top half of them, right? You don't get to encourage them and, and greet them and welcome them and pray with them. 
You don't get to hear their voices bouncing off these walls as one, lifting our voices together to the throne of grace as we worship God together, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs like Ephesians chapter 4 says, right? I can't see you when, when, when I'm preaching. You can't see me. There's not this interactive thing that happens together as we gather together. You can't serve one another like we have to do many times on Sunday mornings and we're privileged to do by watching online. And so again, it's a good tool. It's a necessary tool. We understand understand there are seasons where it is necessary, but I just want to take this opportunity to reinforce the value of this physical worship gathering. It, 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 it's so important in the life of what we do as a church. The, the word church itself, the Greek word ekklesia, means a called out assembly, where we are called out from our homes into a physical gathering space like this. It is vital, it is fundamental to the essence of what church is about, and let me encourage you to, to prioritize the weekly corporate gathering of the church because what happens here is vital to our spiritual health and vitality. But not only this large worship gathering, but also those smaller group gatherings as the early church did in homes, right? Um, we need smaller connections and smaller relational spaces where we can fulfill the many one another commands of Scripture, right? To love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, and there's a funny thing about those one another commands I've learned. You, you can't do them by yourself, right? It requires another. And it also requires that you be in a relationship that's close enough with people where you can effectively do these things, right? Where, where you, you'll know how to pray for them because you know what's going on in their lives. You'll know how to bear their burdens because you'll know what those burdens are. You're living life with them and, and, and alongside them. And that's the importance of these small groups, right? And, and if we would just say, how do we do that here at Cornerstone? Again, I would draw your attention to this simple menu here. Uh, a number of ways you can do it. Our Adult Bible Fellowship on Sunday morning, which will start in a couple of weeks here on September 12th. That's one way if, if Sunday morning is your best experience. But I would say an even deeper and more meaningful experience to enjoy this kind of small group fellowship would be through our, our home teams. And our home teams, as the name would suggest, are small groups of people, maybe 8 to 15 people, um, that gather twice a month in homes, or as the case may be in this season, some of them are meeting over Zoom online. And, and really the purpose is just to build friendships and to build relationships and to serve one another and love each other and care for one another well and serve with each other. It's, it's, it's an important part of, of growing together spiritually. And I would encourage you to, to take a look at the different home teams that are offered in this brochure and on our website. You'll find some that offer child care, some that don't. You'll find some that meet in different areas, uh, some that target maybe particular neighborhoods, different de demographic groups, others that are just open to everybody, multi-generational, right? Uh, groups that meet at different times and days during the week. Look for a group that, that looks like it might be a good fit for you. Feel free to reach out to that leader. The contact information is there. We also have QR codes where you can go right to our website and, and register for one of these groups. Just, just join online. And, and I can tell you, this is such a vital part of our Christian experience. As I look at much of the growth that has happened in my life, it's happened through relationships with others, through these kinds of small group involvements. And so let me encourage you very strongly to gather for worship, check mark, you're doing it, good job today, um, and for fellowship. These large and small group gatherings play such an important role in our lives. I want to encourage you to do that. Um, you know, you think about it, um, this is a strange time in which we live, right? When in many respects we've never been more connected and yet we've never been more isolated from one another. And, and let me read to you uh, an article that appeared in The Atlantic entitled, Is Facebook Making Us Lonely? This is an interesting story. Yvette Vickers, a former model and B-movie star, best known for her role in The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, personal favorite of mine and I'm sure of yours as well, um, but this movie star, she would have been 83 in August 2011, but nobody knows exactly how old she was when she died. According to the Los Angeles coroner's report, she lay dead for the better part of a year before a neighbor and fellow actress, a woman named Susan Savage, noticed cobwebs and yellowing letters in her mailbox, reaching through a broken window to unlock the door and pushed her way through the piles of junk mail and mounds of clothing that barricaded the house. Upstairs, she found Vicar's body, mummified, near a heater that was still running. Her computer was on too, its glow permeating the empty space. The Los Angeles Times posted a story about Vicar's death that quickly went viral. Within two weeks, Vickers' lonesome death was already the subject of 6,057 Facebook posts and 881 tweets. She had long been a horror movie icon. Now she was an icon of a new and different kind of horror, our growing fear of loneliness. Certainly, she received much more attention in death than she did in the final years of her life. 
With no children, no religious group, and no immediately, immediate social circle of any kind, she had begun as an elderly woman to look elsewhere for her companionship. Savage later told Los Angeles Magazine that she had searched Vicar's phone bills for clues about the life that led to such an end. In the months before her grotesque death, Vickers had made calls not to friends or family, but to distant fans who found her through fan conventions and internet sites. Vickers' web of connections had, grow, had grown broader but shallower, as has happened for many of us. We are living in an isolation that would have been unimaginable to our ancestors, and yet we've never been more accessible. We are living in an accelerating contradiction. The more connected we become, the lonelier we are. And, and, and that is so true of our culture, right? We've never spent more time on screens, right, over Zoom and Skype and, and Facebook Live and FaceTime. You know, we've never had more friends on Facebook. We've never been more connected, and we've never been more isolated as a people. And here's my question as we contemplate the, the tragic death of this woman. Nobody knew about it. Here's my question. If you were dying spiritually, if you were dying on the inside, would anybody know? Is anybody close enough to you to, to come alongside you and see that and, and provide the help and the encouragement and the prayer that you need, right? Are you close enough to people to see when they're struggling and come alongside them and encourage them and support them and strengthen them so that we can be the people God's called us to be? Listen, we need that, right? And that's the importance of these kinds of gatherings where we gather together, not only for the large corporate worship, which is important, but also for these smaller environments where we can build those relationships and be the body of, G body of Christ for one another. Um, a vital part of a healthy spiritual diet is gathering for worship and fellowship. Secondly, growing through Bible study. How many of you remember the Russian comedian Yakov Smirnov? You remember him, right? He was a Russian that immigrated to the United States, and, and his entire comedy bit was, was based on humorous observations about, you know, what, what America looks like from the perspective of an outsider coming in. And he said that the thing he loved most about America was the grocery stores, he said, quote, I'll never forget walking down one of the aisles and seeing powdered milk. Just add water and you get milk. Right next to that was powdered orange juice. Just add water and you get orange juice. Then I saw baby powder. And I thought to myself, what a country, right? <laughs> um, you know, it'd be nice if, if growth were as simple as, you know, just add water, if it were instantaneous like that. But we know that's not the case. Growth is the process. To grow, you must be fed, you must be nourished, and, and the same thing is true spiritually. Spiritual growth is a process. It requires that we intentionally, day by day, nourish our souls on the truth of God's Word. Jesus reminded us, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, and guess what? The book that we hold in our hands this morning, it is a life-giving book. In this book, in the pages of Scripture, we encounter the true and living God. We learn of His character. We learn of His might and His power and His justice and His wrath and His fury, but we also learned of His tender loving care and His kindness and His mercy and His compassion and His grace. We encounter God in these pages. We learn what God's up to in this world, right? This book tells us what the, the sovereign story that God is writing over human history and how we fit into that story. In this book, we, we find our place and we gain a sense of perspective. In this book, we find guidance and, and wisdom for life's most challenging decisions. We find comfort and strength and hope when we're going through the tough times. This book is a life-giving, nourishing book that feeds our souls. And I think all of us know that, right? And yet many of us struggle to really discipline ourselves to spend time in this book, even though we know it's good for us and it's essential to our spiritual health. Many of us, every single New Year's, we make a New Year's resolution that we're going to read through the Bible in a year, and by January 5th, we've fallen off the wagon, right? We get into the, the, the genealogies and that kind of thing, and, 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 and we feel guilty about that, but you know what? There's a simple solution to that. If you want to be more consistent in feeding yourself regularly on the nourishment that we find in God's Word, simple solution, don't do it by yourself. Do it with others. Join a Bible study, right? There's some healthy accountability that comes with that, and you benefit from the insights of others. There's something really healthy that happens as we gather in small groups and open up God's Word together and say, hey, let's have God speak to us, and let's talk about what we're learning, and, and we learn from each other as we learn God's Word together. And again, as we think about how we do that here at Cornerstone, a number of ways you can do that. There's a section here called Grow, right? And, and you can do that through our Sunday Morning Adult Bible Fellowship, which again, will start in a couple of weeks. Um, we also have men's and women's Bible studies, small groups where we intentionally dig into God's Word together. 
Uh, our women are about to start a study uh, over the first several chapters of the book of Exodus, right? It's going to start September 15th. In fact, if you're interested in that, you can register in the Welcome Center today. Um, our women's Bible studies meet on Wednesday mornings and Wednesday evenings. Our men's groups, we're going to be studying the book of Joshua this, this fall semester, and our groups meet on Thursday evenings and Friday mornings, and we'll be having some registration information available in the next week or so. But I would just strongly encourage you to consider being part of a small group that is intentional about getting into God's Word and growing together as we nourish our souls on the Scriptures, a vital part of a healthy spiritual diet. We gather, we grow, thirdly, we give. We give of our time and our treasure. And this is where we, we move the focus from ourselves and, and onto others. We move from an inward focus to an outward focus, and that's so important, that we have a heart that serves those around us. Um, I like what I read from one pastor. He said, while preparing a sermon, I posted this question to my friends on Facebook. What makes it hard for you to serve other people? He says they gave some great answers, and here are some of the answers they gave. One person said, serving is hard when it doesn't fit into my schedule or my plan. Like when I go for a walk or take a long bath, but my aging parent needs me to sort their meds, run an errand, or simply be with them. Some of you can identify with that. Here's another answer. Someone said, it's hard when their needs seem endless. I don't want to risk helping or serving because I might get sucked in, being swallowed up in the serving and not getting to be the me I think I am or should be. Another person said, there's such limited energy after a demanding workday, meeting our basic responsibilities, whether with young kids or in the corporate world, how do you balance the need for rest and self-care with serving others? That's a very real tension, right? But the pastor said this, my favorite answer to this question was this, what makes it hard to serve others? Others. <laughs> right? and, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, because people can be difficult sometimes, can't they? Right? And getting involved in the lives of people can, can be a little messy, right? and it can be time-consuming, and it's not fun, and sometimes it's inconvenient, and it's not comfortable, and so many times we just wash our hands and go, you know what, I, I just don't want to get involved in that kind of toxic stuff. It's just not for me. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't take that approach? Aren't you glad that when He looked down uh, on the mess that is humanity, they didn't say, you know what, they're, they're, they're a bunch of messed up people. I, I don't really want to get involved. Aren't you so glad that he, he entered into our mess? Aren't you glad that he put on human skin and, and not only suffered with us, but suffered and died for us so that we could be saved? He's our only hope. And, and now, having done that for us, he calls on us to do something of that in the lives of those around us, to live these kinds of sacrificial, generous lives where we freely give our, ourselves to serve those around us, to give generously of, of our time and of our treasure. That's what he calls us to do. And, and, and we see in the early church a beautiful example of this. Verse 44 says, all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them all, with them all as anyone might have need, right? They put their money where their mouth was, right? They didn't just serve one another with their lips, they served them with their very lives. And that's the kind of people God calls us to be, to be people who, who give generously and sacrificially of our time and our treasure, that early church, man, they were under the gun. They faced persecution. There were people that lost their jobs, their livelihood. They were disowned by their families. Some of them were tortured and imprisoned and put to death for the cause of Jesus. During the first century in Jerusalem, they experienced massive famines and plagues and poverty. They had hardship. And, and what I'm so impressed is that these early Christians, that what they didn't do is they didn't just say, hey, we need to all stay home, turn inward. It's every man for himself right now. No, they opened up their homes. They, they gave generously of their resources. They said, listen, we will do whatever it takes to serve the body of Christ because we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And listen, Cornerstone family, can I just pause and thank you for the wonderful job that you've done in this regard, right? Especially during these difficult days. It's been so impressive to me to see the way this, this church has cared for one another and, and loved one another, um, giving of their time and of their treasure. And we do have a responsibility to do that in, in, in nice, informal, and simple ways. It was my privilege this week, for instance, to, to, to deliver a, 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 an envelope just full of gift cards to, to a family in need. One family wanted to give anonymously, and I got to be the, the messenger, and I delivered those cards, and that family was just so blessed. It was such a meaningful thing to them. But they immediately said, you know what? We've got neighbors down the street that have it harder for us. I think we're going to share some of these gift cards with them, right? That's the heart of our church. I'm so grateful for that, right? That giving generous spirit that happens not even all the time in formal ministry ways, but just in informal ways. It happens through relationships. Can I thank you for being a church like that? That's an amazing thing. But not only do we do these in informal ways, but also through formal ways. And if you're looking for ways to serve, 
to be a, a blessing to others, again, let me draw your attention to that, that give section. One of the best ways to serve here at Cornerstone is to become part of one of our ministry teams. And there's all kinds of ways you can do to get involved. Everything as simple as, as mowing the lawn to being a, a greeter at the front door, coming in a little early, making coffee to bless our guests here on Sunday mornings, um, our hospitality team, our care ministry, providing meals and, and just providing for people who have needs, our children's ministry, a great way to build into the next generation and introduce our little ones to the love of Jesus and, and serve on Sunday mornings, ways you can be involved in student and men's and women's ministry, um, maybe serving on our usher team, right? Um, helping to greet people and seat people and hand things out in the course of a Sunday morning. Our tech team, just keeping our, our technology running smoothly on Sunday mornings. Um, our Velasquez Elementary Outreach, we partner with a local school here, and there's so many ways you can be involved to bless the teachers and the staff and the students there. Our worship team, right? Maybe you have uh, gifts uh, as a vocalist or an instrumentalist. We'd love to hear from you. Or maybe you could help on the media team or a, a camera operator or on the soundboard. There's all kinds of ways you can serve, right? And, and for this church to be maximally effective in, in, in sharing the gospel with this community, we need people on these teams, especially in a season like this. And I'd, I'd encourage you as you go home this morning to look at these opportunities, pray about them, and consider joining one of our ministry teams. Again, the contact information is there. The QR codes can help you sign up online. It's important that we give of our time, also that we give of our treasure, not only in these kind of informal ways as we meet one another's needs as we learn of them, but also, frankly, just giving through the church budget, right? It is through your faithful giving to this church that we're able to continue to serve our community and share the good news of Jesus, right? And if you've never established the habit of giving generously and sacrificially to advance the work of what God's doing here, let me encourage you to do that, right? And again, there's information in that, that brochure how you can do that. But again, a healthy part of a spiritual diet is gathering, growing, and giving of your time and treasure, and finally, going, right? We go and we share the gospel with others. It's not all about just gathering here on Sunday mornings and have a great time. No, God calls us to leave this room and, and to share with others the good news and the power of Jesus that he's done in our lives, right? And again, we see the early church just doing this brilliantly. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. As, as those who were not part of this church community, as they looked in on what was going on there, they saw God moving in such powerful, life-changing ways that they said, man, we want what you have. And day by day, people were, were joining the ranks of those who were giving their lives to Jesus Christ. What an amazing testament. I'd love for that to be our, our experience here at Cornerstone. Right? First Peter reminds us, be ready at all times to, to give a reason for the hope that is within you. And what does that assume? That assumes that we're going to be living our lives with such joy and exuding such hope that people are going to notice, <laughs> that they're going to ask, and we'll have an opportunity to point them to the hope of Jesus Christ. And, and my prayer is that we would be that kind of church, that in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we conduct ourselves here on Sunday morning, the joy with which we worship God, the people who come here would say, wow, that's something powerful. I want that. And that every single week we would see people giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Let's pray that that will be the case. And let's do our part to make sure that is the case. And this idea of going and sharing the gospel with others, in many ways it's not so much a program as it is a personal priority. And it really begins with our own personal network of friends and family members and acquaintances. And so let me introduce to you a simple tool that we use. We call this an, an impact card. And here's a picture of it right here. Um, and it's a simple card that allows us to identify three people in our lives who, as best we know, don't yet have a relationship with Jesus or maybe don't yet have a church home. And, and it allows us to make some simple commitments to ourselves and to the Lord that we're going to uh, pray for them and we're going to look for ways to share kindness with them and show the love of Jesus to them in very practical, tangible ways. And we're going to look for ways to share the gospel with them, look for ways to put them in the path of the gospel by inviting them to a church service or a church event, right? And these are just really good little cards that serve as reminders that we can use every day in our prayer life, maybe use them in your small groups to pray that God would use us in the lives of those around us um, to be um, the hope of Jesus in their lives, that they can come to know Him. Um, it begins with personal relationships, and that's where these impact cards are helpful. I've got a bunch of these in the lobby. Grab one of these if you would and, and, and use it on a daily basis. Um, furthermore, we, we invite you to participate in outreach events. Uh, periodically, we'll have food distributions to those that are in need. Again, we serve a, a local school in a lot of different ways just by serving them. We have just outreach events, fall festivals, and things like that. As we have those opportunities, man, jump in, volunteer, help us serve our community well. 
And not only locally, but globally. Every year, we, we do global mission trips where we take the love and the, the truth of Jesus to a foreign culture. And I tell you what, those are life-changing, horizon-expanding experiences. Let me encourage you to be part of one of those mission trips. And if you want to stay up to date on all these things that are happening, there's an opportunity. You can sign up for our e-news and learn about all these things here. But we've tried to, in one simple tool, make it as easy as possible for you to learn what the options are and, and to make some healthy selections for your own spiritual journey. Um, all of these things are important, really. They really are. And, and they're significant for a well-balanced diet. Um, you know, uh, I, I got COVID, you know that. And uh, I also um, experienced one of the common symptoms of COVID, which is a loss of smell and a loss of, of taste, right? And I was kind of bummed when I, I experienced that. But then I thought, you know what? This isn't all bad because I've been trying to lose a few pounds. And, you know, maybe if I, I don't have a taste, then, then I won't want to eat. And maybe I'll lose, lose some weight. And that, that would have worked were it not for the fact that my doctor also prescribed a steroid for me which increases your appetite. And so even though I couldn't taste, I was just always hungry and I was like just grabbing food here and there and eating junk food. And then and suddenly I'm like, I'm gaining weight. And I'm like, whoa, Brent, you got you to slow things down a little bit, right? I realized my, my appetite and my senses are all out of whack. So I realized I got to be really careful right now, intentional about what I eat and how much I eat, or I'm going to walk out of this COVID experience, you know, twice my size. And, 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 and I had to be intentional about that, right? And really, in a, in a sense, we all need to be intentional like that all the time, right? Um, by nature, we tend to, to, to gravitate towards junk food and things that are easy and quick and convenient, which may not really be good for us. And, and, and we need to be intentional, don't we, about making healthy choices for our diet. And the same thing's true spiritually, right? By nature, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us and we're Christians, we still have a sin nature, don't we? There's still a struggle there, and we still have unhealthy appetites sometimes, which, which draw us towards things that maybe aren't always good for us or things that are easy or convenient. And I think what God's calling us to do here is to say, hey, if you're going to be healthy, you have to be intentional to make some healthy spiritual choices. You have to put into your lives some things that, that maybe aren't always convenient or comfortable, but they're good for you. They'll stretch your spiritual muscles. They'll, they'll nourish your soul spiritually. And that would be my challenge for all of us, is that we would take to heart not just this document, but we would look through these things and go, hey, how can I gather, grow, give, and go? right? How can I build a well-balanced diet? And that's my challenge to you. Take a look at this this week. Think about it. Pray about it. You don't have to do everything in here, but I would say, hey, let's gather. Let's, let's make corporate worship and small group involvement of some kind of priority. Let's grow through, through the study of God's Word together. Let's give of our time and our treasure. Let's, let's go and share the good news of Jesus with others. Figure out what that looks like. Choose from these basic food groups, but b build a life that will, that will create a healthy spiritual diet for you. And I know that these are difficult times. These are crazy times. They are, right? And we might be very tempted to go, yeah, I'll do all that after the pandemic or, or after this particular struggle or after this particular trial. No, we can't wait, right? We need to be wise. We need to be discerning. But this is not the time to pull back. This is the time to push forward. This time more than ever is when our world needs hope. It's when the world needs the love of Jesus and we need each other, right? And we have to be faithful to do these things. So my prayer for us as a church is that we would individually as Christians build a healthy spiritual diet so that collectively we as a church can continue to carry out the mission that God has called us to fulfill as we gather, grow, give, and go. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for the privilege of, of knowing you and serving you. And I do pray that in these seasons of, of challenge and difficulty that we would um, not only give attention to our physical health, but also our spiritual health, that, that you would help us to make healthy uh, menu choices, if you will, so that we can be the people you've called us to be and be effective in these difficult times. We thank you, Father, for your goodness to us and the privilege of serving you. In Jesus' name, amen.